Hello, and welcome to the month of Spooky 2022. Scary stories are a part of life. We've been telling them since the dawn of man over campfires, radio broadcasts, television, and these days, social media. They remind us of our own mortality, get our adrenaline going, and send chills through our bodies that, well, we just can't explain. During this month, you can expect the unexpected, hear the unbelievable, and witness stories that will stretch your imagination. Why? Because that is what we do here at Ron's Amazing Stories. So settle in for the spooky and be prepared to be taken away from today. This five-minute mystery is being brought to you by the month of Spooky 2022. Does that mean that this FFM will be scary? No. In fact, you can expect the same silliness and lack of story we always have. Oh, that's a relief. If you say so. Hello, Mr. Minton. How are you? Well, hello, Joe. You're going to take a nice Turkish bath in the steam room, Mr. Minton? Yeah. Look at that fat, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> All right, here's a towel. Uh, you like a massage after me? No, no, I haven't time. Say, is old man Wallace in there getting steam? I said I'd meet him. Yeah, yeah, he must be plenty hot by now. There's five or six customers in there. Oh, I'll open the door for you, Mr. Minner. Oh, thanks, Joe. Uh, call me in ten minutes. Sure, sure. Uh, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Let me see. Mr. Turner said I should call him in 15 minutes. Mr. Wallace said that... <laughs> What's the matter? Steam pipe broke, maybe? Somebody getting burnt? What's the matter in there? You got trouble? Who screamed? Oh, the old man Wallace has just been stabbed to death. He's been stabbed in the back. Well, George, you find anything? Uh, there's still a lot of steam in that room, Chief, but I searched it thoroughly. There's no knife anywhere. Ceiling, floor, walls. And yet Wallace was stabbed. There's no doubt about it. Mm. And what's worse, the room was so thick with steam, no one saw the murderer do it. Uh, what about the men that were in there? Uh, I searched them thoroughly, Chief. Nothing but this collection of towels. Uh, Joe, uh, do you see anyone go into that steam room with anything but a towel in his hands? You were standing right here at the door all the time. No, sir, Chief. Just towels and maybe a toothbrush. Toothbrush? Yeah, a toothbrush with a little black case. After the murder, Mr. Minter handed it to me as he came out of the steam room and told me to put it in his locker, but I didn't have time. Uh, here it is right uh, here. Let's see. Uh, toothbrush, all right. Good solid plastic tube with a top to put it in. You couldn't stab a man. Wait a minute. This holder. George, quick. Get Minton in here. Right. I'm going to look in that steam room once more, but now I know what I'm looking for. Uh, Mr. Minton, would you please get a robe on? The chief would like to see you in here a minute. Well, I'm glad to talk to the chief any time, but I'm sure I've told him all I know about this thing. Uh, he is the chief now. Oh, hello, Mr. Minton. Just a couple of questions more. Is this your toothbrush in case? What? Why, Joe, I, I thought I told you... It to... is yours, and you had it with you in that steam room when Wallace was killed. Mindern, I'm arresting you for the murder of James Wallace. Do you know how Mindern killed James Wallace in the steam room of a Turkish bath? The chief will explain his deductions in just a moment. In the meantime... I thought you said this one wasn't creepy. No, I said it wouldn't be scary. There's a difference. Well, that opening bit about body fat and a massage was, well, creepy. Guys. It's creepy. See? Agreed. But what about the mystery? I'll bet you'll never figure this one out, BG. The knife was made of ice. You know, you really take the wind from beneath my wings. Quoting Bet Midler now. Whenever possible. And here's the chief to tell you how James Wallace was killed. The method used was most unusual. When we think of stabbing, we think of knives. But no ordinary knife killed James Wallace. It was a disappearing knife. Ah, uh, how could a knife disappear, chief? It's impossible. Not if the knife were made of dry ice. Minton's toothbrush holder was a plastic mold in the shape of a dagger. In it, he carried into that steam room a dagger made of dry ice. 
withdrew it from the mold at the proper moment, and stabbed Wallace. He counted on it dissolving in the steam before it was discovered. I found a piece of it giving off its own form of steam in one corner of the steam room. Mintern killed Wallace and almost got away with a perfect crime if the murder weapon had disappeared. Well, there you have it. Nearly the perfect crime. That M.O. is so cliché. True, but the story was recorded in the 1940s. Dry ice was a new thing. Actually, a French inventor, Adrien Jean Pierre Delorier, discovered it in the 1800s. BG, you can be a real jackass. This is true. <laughs> Welcome to the month of Spooky 2022. Every year around this time, we turn to the macabre and take a look at the dark side. In this episode, it's all about the doll. That cute and cuddly creature that is the stuff of nightmares. Movies like Child's Play or Annabelle have turned these figurines of joy into menaces and harbingers of evil. What we have are three doll stories inspired by you guys. An Elsa doll, Grandma's favorite doll, and a jealous clown doll. Then we'll play one of the top 31 scariest stories from the golden age of radio. It came in at number 15, and while not exactly a doll story, it does explore one possible origin of the wax mannequin. But before we get to any of that, we have a special Halloween audiobook review. Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook and a 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash Ron's Amazing Stories. Audible has sponsored the show now since July of 2019. We have reviewed more than 140 audiobooks and the list keeps growing. Did you know that Audible has over 200,000 books available? And a lot of those are included in the free catalog. Audible is amazing, and it is the perfect companion to Ron's Amazing Stories. If you like this podcast, you're going to love Audible. So what am I listening to? Halloween Folklore and Festivities by Ruth Edna Kelly and Mary E. Blaine. Narrated and edited by Adam Skusen. How else to begin the month of spooky than by presenting an audiobook to help not only inform, but prepare for Halloween? By far my favorite holiday of the year. This is not your normal run-of-the-mill book. I could describe it to you, but I think the promo does a much better job than I ever could. So let's listen to Adam tell us all about it. Halloween Folklore and Festivities is a compilation of two classic Halloween books written in the early 1900s. The Book of Halloween by Ruth Edna Kelly and Games for Halloween. In The Book of Halloween, Ruth Edna Kelly explains the origins of Halloween, including the ancient myths, beliefs, and rituals of the Celts and the Teutons. Many of these rituals, which are now associated with Halloween, were originally part of the customs belonging to other significant days in the year, 
such as May Day, Midsummer, and Christmas. She traces those ancient origins through other cultures that have influenced the customs of our modern Halloween celebrations. This book also contains quotations from ancient and modern poems that demonstrate how the spirit of Halloween appears throughout classic literature. Games for Halloween by Mary E. Blaine is a collection of games, decorations, and charms from the Halloween celebrations of 1912. What was once a description of modern Halloween activities is now an authentic glimpse into the traditional Halloween celebrations of the past. The two books have been edited together as a single work connecting the ancient folklore to 20th century festivities. It has everything you need to throw a truly authentic Halloween celebration. The origins of our modern-day Halloween celebrations find their roots in ancient pagan beliefs. An exploration of the history of Halloween requires an understanding of old-world mythology and sun worship. With this foundation, the many cultures and regions that have contributed to Halloween can be explored. Most of our Halloween traditions come from the Celts, who were an ancient people that inhabited Western Europe, including Ireland, Scotland, England, Brittany, and France. As a herding society, they recognized the midpoint between the fall equinox and winter solstice as the time to bring in the flocks. This time was called Samhain, which means summer's end. Religious leaders called Druids led the people in seasonal ceremonies. Many of their rituals involved placating powerful spirits, honoring the dead, and seeking omens of the future. When the Romans conquered the area, the power of the Druids interfered with their rule, so they attempted to abolish the pagan fire festivals. They demonized the ancient gods and grafted new names onto the old celebrations to honor the Roman beliefs. Pomona, she who cares for fruits, became the new symbol of the harvest, and Samhain became the vigil of all hallows or all saints. The Romans also conquered the Scandinavian peoples known as the Teutons. The Teutons also had a vast spiritual belief system with many gods and a rich mythology. The Romans attempted to eradicate the Teutonic religion in a similar way. The ancient gods Freya and Odin, who had power over the dead, became devils. Loki, the evil god of fire who had been cast out of heaven, had a special connection to Satan. Thus, any who continued to worship their ancient gods were branded as witches. Many other cultures have contributed beliefs and rituals to this holiday, but only the Celts and the Teutons celebrated an occasion that actually resembles our modern Halloween. Now, my thoughts on this audiobook. It is intended to give the listener an account of the origins and history of Halloween. It gives you all the background you'll ever need and then tells you how to put together one of the most authentic Halloween parties you could possibly imagine. It has some games that I've never heard of, tricks that are borderline in today's society, poetry, treats, and even some dreams that are downright creepy. All in all, the perfect guide to a great holiday. Now, if any of that appeals to you, head to audibletrial.com slash Ron's Amazing Stories, and you can have Halloween folklore and festivities for free. Here is what Audible has set up for us. They are offering a free audiobook and 30 days to give you the opportunity to check out their service. This also grants you access to the included catalog, which is updated constantly with new titles. So, to download your free audiobook today, go to audibletrial.com slash Ron's Amazing Stories. Thank you, Audible. And now, it's time for your spooky stories. These are your stories, sent by you, for you. Welcome to the first round of Creepy Stories for the month of Spooky 2022. All of today's stories are about 
unexplainable dolls that do some pretty strange stuff. Our first story comes from an article I found in the October 2021 issue of Esquire. While I don't normally review Esquire, the title grabbed me and I just had to read it. It was 10 Terrifying But True Horror Stories Reported in the News. One of these stories was titled The Haunted Doll. I've always been fascinated by haunted dolls and have had experiences with not one, but two dolls that I can't explain. I decided to do some research on this, and what I found was pretty crazy. When you think of haunted dolls, it's likely the creepy old Victorian porcelain kind that spring to mind. They are all over the place, and haunted versions of them can even be purchased on eBay. No, I'm not kidding. You probably wouldn't think of Disney's Elsa doll, from the movie Frozen, as a possible candidate. Well, one that was gifted in Christmas 2013 made the headlines. The original story was reported on KPRC2 Houston. Here is a quote from that story. The doll recited phrases from the movie Frozen and sang Let It Go when the button on its necklace was pressed. For two years it did that in English, Emily Medina said. In 2015 it started alternating between Spanish and English. There wasn't a button that changed this, it was just random. The family has owned the doll for more than six years and has never changed its batteries. The mother said that the doll would randomly begin to speak and sing even when it was switched off. Crazy, but okay. I wondered if there was more to this story, and there is. The family decided to throw the creepy doll out in December of 2019. Weeks later, they found it inside a bench in their living room. The kids insisted that they didn't put it there, and their mother believed them because why would they hang out in the trash? At this point, Elsa ceased to sing the English rendition of Let It Go altogether, speaking only in Spanish when pressed. The family then double-bagged the bizarre doll and placed it at the bottom of their garbage, which was taken out the next day. They went on a trip shortly after, But when they returned, Elsa had come back as well and was waiting for them in the backyard of their home. This time, the family mailed Elsa to a friend in Minnesota who taped the haunted doll to the front bumper of his truck. Now, that's where the story ends for now. It doesn't seem to have made its way back to Houston, at least yet. I was able to find the Medina family on Facebook. I have sent them a friend request and have yet to be admitted into the family's inner circle of friends. Not too surprising. If I do, I will keep all of you updated on this one. Our next haunted doll story comes from listener Elsa Kimora from Bridgeport, Montana. Yes, her name is Elsa, same as the doll listed in our previous story. How about that? Elsa sent in her story via the website and has titled it Grandma's Doll. Hello, Ron. This is something I experienced shortly before moving out of my teenage home a couple years ago. My great-grandmother collected dolls. One of the dolls I took a particular liking to because of how creepy it looked. She picked up on it and actually gave it to me not too long before she passed away. I was like 12 or 13 years old at the time. Fast forward a couple years later. My two stepbrothers and I were sitting in the living room chatting one late night, around 1 a.m. or so. For context, this is a cookie-cutter house. So when you walk in, you basically have to choose between going upstairs or downstairs. The living room is directly upstairs from the front door. There is a fireplace on the left-hand wall, but not much else to note since it was an open concept. Adjacent to the wall, there was a railing overlooking the doorway area, 
and in front of the railing is the couch. There is also a television hanging on the wall opposite to the couch. During our conversation, we got on the topic of childhood paranormal experiences. Joking around, I went and grabbed the doll from my bedroom and leaned it up on the shelf above the fireplace. I made sure when I put the doll up there that it was sitting securely so as not to slip off. Some things that are now important. The television is on, but just on a no-signal screen. Like I said, we were preparing to move. There were boxes and trash piled up in front of the fireplace, at least three to five feet away. There was a fire in the fireplace. And finally, we were sitting on the couch at the time. In the middle of a story my younger stepbrother was telling, the doll was flung forward from the shelf, landing a few feet away from the boxes. It flew a good six to eight feet from the fireplace. At the exact same time the doll made contact with the ground, the television shut off and then turned itself back on again. We've never had any electrical issues in that house or with that TV. Needless to say, we jumped up and cursed just a bit. We stood there and stared at the thing on the floor for a while. Then my brother walked over to pick it up. As he bent down, it slid along the floor and ended up in the fireplace, and it began to burn. I ran over, dragged it out, and put out the flame that had started on its dress. I know you probably won't believe this, and my brothers can't collaborate, but I am sure that I heard screaming. I know people are going to say it's possible that the doll had just fallen, but the doll flew off the shelf even though it was leaning backwards. And things that fall don't typically fall outwards several feet. Elsa Kilmora, Bridgeport, Montana No, Elsa, they do not. What a great story, and I want to thank you for sharing it with us. Our last one is a short story that reminds us even short stories can be creepy as heck. This one comes from Cindy Ward. Cindy lives in Buffalo, New York, and has titled her story, The Clown Doll. When I was little, I got this one really creepy clown doll. I was terrified of the thing, but I didn't want to say anything to my parents. I remember telling them how much I loved it. I would wake up during the night with the doll staring at me. Every single morning when I woke up, the doll had a spider on it. My parents said it was not a big deal until the spider became a black widow. My parents threw it upstairs into the attic, which is right above my room. The whole next night, I heard a thumping over and over again. Then I got a new creepy doll. I immediately felt a connection with it. The first night after I got her, I heard that loud thumping and banging again. So I decided to check it out. I knew it was coming from the attic, and the closer I got, the louder it got. I got so scared that I ran back downstairs to see my parents. I asked them if they heard the noise. They replied, No. That experience still haunts me to this day, and the clown doll, well, as far as I know, it's still up there. Somewhere. Cindy Ward, Buffalo, New York. Okay, Cindy, that is a strange story. So many questions. The primary being is that you said the new doll was creepy too. What's the story there? And are the two dolls somehow connected? Let me know and thank you for sharing your story. Well, that's it for this time. If you have a story that you would like to share, like Cindy did, 
head to the main website at ronsamazingstories.com, click on the story submission banner, leave your story, give it a title, and please tell me where you're from. I'll read it if I can. Our featured story comes from the OTR series Escape, starring William Conrad. A penniless poet, played by Elliot Lewis, decides to move into a department store and live in ease and comfort off its inventory. Great idea, but he didn't bargain for the race of pale mutants who already lived there, or for how they dispose of anyone who rebels against them. The story is titled Evening Pimrose, and it first aired November 5th, 1947. Did you lose an election bet yesterday? Feel a bad cold coming on? Want to get away from it all? We offer you escape. You are groping in the midnight dimness of a gigantic department store. And suddenly you realize that you're not alone. But a hundred eyes are glaring at you from the shadows. A hundred hands reaching for your throat. And your most urgent desire is to escape. Escape. Produced and directed by William N. Robeson. And carefully plotted to free you from the four walls of today for a half hour of high adventure. Tonight we escape to the dark labyrinth of a giant department store in the dead of night and to a fantastic world of night dwellers as John Collier imagines it in his eerie story Evening Primrose Sadie? <laughs> Sadie, hey, what's the matter? It's me. Oh, Sam, you nearly scared me to death. What do you mean coming in so quiet? Hey, I didn't mean to scare you. I thought you'd be asleep. I didn't want to wake you. Oh, Sam, I'm glad you're home. Hey, hey what's the matter? Oh, it's terrible. You gotta do something, Sam. Well, 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 what's terrible? It's this. Just look at this. What's terrible about that? Looks like an ordinary pad of paper to me. Yeah, it just did. That's just what I thought. But it's got writing in it. It's awful. Oh, wait a minute. Maybe you better tell me what this is all about. Well, today I went shopping down at Bracey's department store. Huh? I, I needed some writing paper, so I picked this up. It, it was on top of the pile and bought it and brought it home. But tonight when I opened it, I found it's got writing in it. Well, that's nothing so terrible. Just take it back tomorrow and make him give you a new one. Oh, no, you don't understand. It's what's written in it that's so terrible. What do you mean, what's written in it? Here, you gotta read it. Oh, Sadie. No, no, right now. Read it. Look, Sadie, I'm tired. I've been please, bowling all Please, Sam, these... please. Just read it. Uh, all right, for Pete's sake. Uh, October 13. Today I made my decision. I decided to say goodbye to the world to get out. Leave, break away. And I have done it. Ah, oh, said it's a lot of... Go on, read. Uh, and now I am free. Really free. Really free. Yes, yes, I, I am, am free. free at last. The world is an intolerable place for a poet. I was broke, starving at my wit's end. And then I had a brilliant idea. I would escape to a place where I had no need to earn a living, where I could write to my heart's content in peace and security. Where is this place? Right under your nose. So close you'd never think of it. 
I am now living in Bracey's department store. I have everything within arm's reach that anyone would need or desire. And it's all free. Absolutely free. I arrived this afternoon. I'd spent three days looking over all of the department stores in town. I decided on Bracey's because of the completeness of their food department. Therefore, this afternoon, I entered the store and went immediately to the fourth floor to the rug department and hid myself in this dusty, out-of-the-way corner behind a pile of carpets. Once I'm settled, I'll furnish it with the best of modern pieces from the furniture department. It's small, but I'll be cozy enough and safe. After the store closed, I made my first venture out. I tiptoed as far as the stationery counter and got this paper, the writer's primary need. Now, after making my initial entry, I'll go out and get food, wine, the pillows for my bed, perhaps a fancy dressing gown. This is perfect. I'll be able to write here. Dawn, October 14th. I'm almost too unnerved to write this. The whole thing is unbelievable. After the store was dark and completely quiet, I crept out and started for the food department. One's footsteps echo hollowly in an empty department store at night, and I found myself gliding along the floor on tiptoe, moving as silently as possible. But the sound of footsteps persisted. Suddenly I realized they were not my own. The night watchman. I was in the Salon Moderne. Quickly I seized a mink coat from a hanger, draped it about my shoulders, and stood stock still. I could have reached out and touched him. But he passed by without so much as a glance. I started to smile. But the smile froze on my lips. There was someone else here. I was looking straight into a pair of eyes. Large, flat, luminous, inhuman eyes peering at me from among the Mrs. Tailored suits a dozen feet away. They belonged to a creature dressed as a man, but he was as pale as a creature found under a stone. His hands hanging motionless at his sides looked more like the fins on a fish than human hands. And then he spoke. Not bad, for a beginner. I... I'm sorry, I didn't know anybody else uh, lived here. Oh, yes. We live here. It's delightful. We? Yes, all of us. Don't you see? Look around you. I looked around. I saw nothing. I looked again. I saw an old man come clambering out from behind a clock. There were three elderly ingenues, incredibly emaciated, pale as lace, almost transparent, simpering before the perfume counter. A chintzy lady swam out from the curtains and drapes. They came swarming thick around me, pale, thin, wispy, moving silently, fluttering like gauze in the wind, whispering. A raw he looks. Who is he? As coarse as the sun. What is he doing here? A detective. Send for the dark men. Yes, send for the dark men. The dark men. They were pressing around me, clawing, holding me, their pale faces contorted with venomous, inhuman hatred. I was paralyzed. All I could do was repeat over and over again, I'm not a detective. I'm not a detective. I'm not. A burglar, then. A burglar? Tie him up. Hold him. Carry him to the place. Send for the dark men. Stop. Stop. Let him speak. I'm not a detective. Or a burglar. I'm a poet. Then what are you doing here? I've... I've renounced the world. I came here to live where I could be alone. Away from the world. Why, then, he's come over to us. He's just like us. He's come over to us. 
a poet. She must meet Mrs. Vanderpant. Yes, Mrs. Vanderpant. She's coming now. I follow their eyes toward the balcony. There, coming down the wall like an ancient spider, clambered an old lady. Wrinkled and cracked and emaciated, she must have been at least 80. A shadowy matriarch. And the things around me bowed and scraped as she reached the floor and floated toward us. What's going on here? Where is that stupid girl? What's keeping her? Oh, uh, Mrs. Vanderpant. Well, what is it? Who's this, Mr. Roscoe? Uh, Mrs. Vanderpant, may I present Mr... Uh... Oh, uh, Snell, Mr. Snell, Mr. Charles Snell. Yes, yes, of course. Mr. Snell. He is a poet, and he's come here to live. Oh, he has, has he? That's what he says, and I believe him. Well... It, he avoided the night watchman quite neatly, it, for a beginner. Well, thank you. Hmm. Very well, we shall see. A poet should find inspiration here. Mr. Snell, Mrs. Vanderpant is our grand old lady. Oh? I am quite the oldest inhabitant here, Mr. Snell. Three mergers and a complete rebuilding. But they didn't get rid of me. Oh, really? Oh, nice. Where is Ella? Where is my broth? She's bringing it, Mrs. Vanderpant. Oh, terrible little creature. Uh, she is our foundling, Mr. Snell. Uh, she's not quite our sort. Is that so? I have been here, Mr. Snell, ever since the terrible times of the 80s. Uh, I was a young girl then. A beauty, they say. And poor papa lost his money. Oh, braces meant a lot to a young girl in those days. So when I wasn't able to have a charge account, I came here for good. That's better than a charge account. I was quite alarmed when others began to come after the crash of 1907, but it was the dear judge. How do you do? Yes. The colonel. How do you do? Yes. Mrs. Bilby. How do you do? Mrs. Bilby. Uh, Mrs. Bilby writes plays. Oh. And comes of an old Philadelphia family. Oh, you will find us quite nice here, Mr. Snell. I'm sure I will. Uh, and, of course, all our dear young people came in 1929. Their poor papas jumped from skyscrapers. They couldn't bear to be without charge accounts either. Do you mean all these people live here? Oh, and many more. You shall meet them all later. Oh, here comes Ella with my block. Come, come, you stupid thing. Mrs. Vanderpant is waiting. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. I'm coming as fast as I can. Now, be careful. Don't spill it. Oh, but she's young. Well, of course, she is a little younger than most of them. And she... she's different. She's beautiful. Mr. Snell, Ella is Mrs. Vanderpant's maid. That's right, old man. She's really not our sort at all. You shouldn't say such things. She can hear you. Oh, that doesn't matter. You'll understand these things better after you've been here a while. But it seems to me that you would... Mr. Snell, we have certain rules here. They are necessary for our survival. I'm sure you won't find it hard to observe them. Well, yes, I appreciate... I should advise that you try... If you do not, that would be most unfortunate, Mr. Snell. Most unfortunate for you. October 15th. You can imagine my feelings last night. My first thought was to escape as quickly as possible. In fact, I planned to wait till morning when the store opened, then quit my hiding place, mingle with the crowds, and leave Bracey's forever. But just at dawn, Mr. Roscoe brought me a cup of coffee, which must have been drugged, for I fell asleep. And when I awoke, I found I had slept all day, and night was closing over the store once more. Later, I've spent my second night here. I saw Ella again. Ella, the pearl of this remote, fantastic cave. She's not like the others, a trifle pale, but otherwise normal and human and beautiful, a child of perhaps 18. She's the only thing that makes this nightmare bearable. October 20th, 
Escape seems almost impossible. There's a very effective burglar alarm system and the doors are all carefully guarded. But that's nothing compared to the Dark Men. Who are the Dark Men? I don't know. But they threaten any transgressor with these Dark Men. I shall try to discover who they are. At least I am sure I'm watched, though they've begun to trust me now. Speaking to the Night Watchman would be suicide. Even if he believed my fantastic story or didn't shoot me as a burglar, I'm convinced that neither Ella nor I could get out of here alive. She and the Night Watchman are the only real people here. And how the others hate the Night Watchman. Odious, vulgar creature. You reeks of the coarse sun. Oh, come now, Mrs. Bilby. He's really a personable young man. Very young for a Night Watchman. Mr. Snell, sometimes I wonder about your taste. You mustn't stay so much to yourself, Mr. Snell. You must become better acquainted with our ways. Yes, old man. You must come to the play tonight. We're going to be entertained with one of Mrs. Bilby's tragic comedies. Love in Shadowland. I'm sure you'll enjoy it. I'm sure I will. It's really a festive occasion, you know. Wanamaker's is coming over. Wanamaker's? Yes. The entire colony over at Wanamaker's is coming here en masse to attend the play. You mean there are people living in other stores? Oh, dear, yes. Didn't you know? Of course, the best people live in Braces and Wanamaker's. Oh, come now, Mrs. Bilby. There's some very nice people at Alton's. I beg your pardon, Mrs. Bilby. Oh, hello, Ella. Good evening, Mr. Snell. Mrs. Bilby. Well, what is it? Please, ma'am, I'd so love to see your play tonight. May I have your permission? Certainly not. You know better than that, you stupid creature. You know where you belong? In the basement for the garbage cans. But Mrs. Bilby couldn't... Mr. Snell. Ella, you're becoming entirely too forward of late. I'd advise you to watch your step. Remember the dark men. Oh, no, please, Mr. Roscoe. I'll be good. I promise I will. No, please don't send for the dark men. I'm sorry, Mrs. Bilby. Excuse me. Ella, come back. Mr. Snell, you forget yourself. Let her go. But how can you treat her like that? Why do you always frighten her? And what is all this about the dark men? Well, the dark men... Oh, are... please, Mr. Roscoe, not now. You'll spoil our whole evening. And I do so want Mr. Snell to enjoy my play. Very well. Later, Mr. Snow. But I want to know about the dark man. Later, later. October 21st. At last I found an opportunity to speak to Ella alone. I hadn't dared to speak to her before. Here one has a sense always of pale eyes secretly watching. But last night at the play I induced a fit of hiccups. As I anticipated, I was sternly reprimanded and told to go and secrete myself in the basement where the night watchman wouldn't hear me. This was exactly what I had planned. I went to the basement. There in the darkness, among the garbage cans and the rats, I heard sobbing. Ella! Ella! Oh! Ella, is that you? Yes. Why are you crying? What is it, Ella? They... They wouldn't even let me see the play. Is that all? Oh, Mr. Snell, I'm so unhappy. There, there. You mustn't cry. You're the only one, the only one who's kind. Ella, why are you here? Why do they treat you so differently? Because I'm not like them. I didn't choose to come here. You mean you're held prisoner? Yes. You see, I was only six. I came here on a shopping tour with my mother. I got lost and fell asleep behind a counter. It was dark when I awoke and they found me. Some of them wanted to send for the dark men because they were afraid I would tell on them. But Mrs. Vanderpant said, no, I could stay and be your maid. I've been here ever since. Since you were six? Haven't you ever tried to get away? Oh, no. I don't know anything about out there. I wouldn't know what to do. Besides, I'm afraid if anyone tries to get out, they send for the dark men. Ella, who are the dark men? Don't you know? Oh, it's horrible. Tell me. You know how people live in all the stores, at Gimbel's and Bloomingdale's Yes, and... yes, I know. Well, the dark men live at the Undertaker's. Good heavens. And whenever someone dies or breaks the rules, or when a burglar gets in and sees these people and might tell, they send for the dark men. Oh, horrible. They put the body in the butcher shop in the food department. And then the dark, dark men come. I saw them once. It was terrible. What do they do? They go in where the dead person is. They have wax with them and all sorts of things. And when they're gone, there's just a wax model left on the counter. Then our put, people put a frock on it 
or bathing suit, mix it up with the other wax models in the windows, and nobody ever knows. Ella, you mean all these dummies around us? Oh, not all of them. But if you displease these people, the same thing will happen to you. October 30th. I haven't kept up my journal. Writing has been out of the question. Once more, I'm frozen with terror. But not for myself now. For Ella. They hate her. Any time they might turn against her and send for the dark men. My mind is filled with her. I dream of her every day. I live to see her at night. We've managed it several times. They trust me now and let me roam about without interference. Finally tonight, I met her again and said it. Ella, I love you. Oh, Charles. I love you, Ella. Let's get married. Or whatever they do here. Then we can live together in my home in the carpet department. They wouldn't dare hurt you then. Oh, Charles, Don't look I... so dismayed. If you like, we'll go away from here. Maybe we can get transferred to... to Bergdorf Goodman's overlooking Central Park. Don't, Charles, don't. You mustn't. But I love you. Ella, you're not in love with someone else. Yes, Charles, I am. But who? I thought you hated them all. It must be Roscoe. He's the only one that's young enough. Oh, no, Charles, not Roscoe. Especially not him. I do hate them all. They make me shudder. Well, who is it, then? It's him. Who? The night watchman. No, impossible. I love him. He smells of the sun. Ella. Oh, it was wonderful the way it happened. Don't tell on me, Charles, or they'll punish me. Oh, no, no. I was careless, and there he was, coming around the corner in the ladies' lingerie department. I was caught. There were only some wax models in their underthings. There was nothing else to do. I slipped off my dress and stood still. Oh, I see. He stopped and looked at me. And Charles, he spoke to me. He said, Say, honey, I wish they made him like you on 8th Avenue. Charles, wasn't that a lovely thing to say? Personally, I should have said Park Avenue. It doesn't matter what street. It was a lovely thing to say. But what can you do about him? Ella, he belongs to another world. Yes, to 8th Avenue. I want to go there. Charles, are you really my friend? Yes, of course I am. Then I'll tell you. I'm going to stand there again in the lingerie department so he'll see me. And then? Perhaps he'll speak to me again. Ella, you're only torturing yourself. No, because this time I shall answer him. He'll take me away. Take you away? Oh, no, Ella, I couldn't bear that. You don't love him. You only think you do because you think he'll take you out of here, but you don't know that he will. And I will, Ella. I've made up my mind. No, Charles, I couldn't let you do it. Even if I loved you, you couldn't do it, Charles. Why not? Because you really belong here. You're... You've become one of them now. Ella, you mustn't say that. It's true. And... Charles, I've got to go. There's someone watching us. I feel it. No, wait, Ella. Goodbye, Charles. No, Ella. Come back. Ella. Please, old man. You'll arouse the night watchman. Roscoe. Yes. Oh, love can be very upsetting, can't it? You heard? Yes. Just the last moment or so. Very touching. <laughs> Yet it's understandable. I've been attracted to Ella myself. So she loves another, hmm? Too bad, old boy. Who could it be? Could it be that I am the cause of your heartbreak? You flatter yourself too much, Rascal. Well, then whom? The old judge? Well, certainly not. The colonel? Hardly. None of those. Oh, not one of the customers. The staff? She loves the night watchman. Can you imagine that? She loves the... Oh? Roscoe, I shouldn't have said that. It, it's not true. At least I don't think it's true. You wouldn't... Roscoe, you said you loved her too. You wouldn't do anything. Tell anybody. This is a secret between us. Between friends, isn't it? Of course, old man. As secret as the grave. She's young. Perhaps he'll leave and she'll forget him in time. Who knows? Perhaps she'll learn to love you or me. Of course, in time. And we'll figure a way to keep her safe here. Absolutely safe. Now, don't you worry about it. It's almost dawn. Time for bed. Good morning, Mr. Snell. <laughs> Uh, 
early evening November 4th. I was a fool. I should have known he couldn't be trusted. He must have gone straight to Mrs. Vanderpant because this evening the atmosphere has changed. People flicker to and fro, smiling nervously, horribly with a sort of frightened, sadistic exaltation. An informal dance in the record department has been called off. I can't find Ella. I'm going out again now to look for her. Roscoe, what have you done with her? Shh, shh, shh. Quiet, old boy. The night watchman. I don't care. What have you done? Whatever I did was for your own good as well as for the good of us all. Wait a minute. What is that? What are those people carrying? That's Ella. She's tied up. They're carrying... Ella! Ella! Stop it, Charles. Stop it. Let me go. Oh, stop, Charles. Stop it. You'll arouse the night watchman. No, they're... They're taking her in... Into the butcher shop. Roscoe. Yes. Those are the dark men. Good Lord. Midnight. I'm scribbling this last entry hurriedly. They are in there in the butcher shop with Ella. The dark men. There's only one thing to do. I'm going to find the night watchman and tell him. He and I will save her if we can. And if we are overpowered... Well, I will leave this pad on the stationery counter. Tomorrow, if I live, I will recover it. If I do not, whoever finds this and reads it, look in the store windows. Look for three new wax dummies. Two men, one rather sensitive looking, and a girl. She has blonde hair and blue eyes, and her nose turns up a little. Look for us, and then find them. Smoke them out. Exterminate, Exterminate them. them. Avenge us. Oh, Sam, isn't it horrible? Ah. We've we, we got to do something. Tell somebody something. Oh, Sam, what'll we do? Do? Well, nothing. Go to bed. But, Sam... Well, whoever wrote this has sure got a weird sense of humor. It's probably some clerk down at Bracey's who ought to be fired. But... You... You mean you, you think it's just a story? Are you kidding? You don't believe this stuff, do you? Well, I don't know. I, I, I oh, just... forget it, baby. Come on, snap out of it. I shouldn't leave you alone. You get too many ideas when I go out bowling at night. But, uh, don't you think maybe we ought to just, uh, take it back and show somebody? Oh, nuts. It's not worth the bother. They'd laugh at you, baby. They'd think you were crazy or something. Yeah. Yeah. I guess you're right. I guess I was silly. Yeah, forget it. Oh, come on. Let's go to bed. Huh? I'm tired. Okay. Okay, Sam. Gee, you know, there for a while I sure was scared. <laughs> oh, I even forgot what I was going to tell you. Sam, I found the cutest dress today. Only 1995. Yeah, baby? Yeah. It was in the window at Bracey's. It was on a beautiful little wax model with blonde hair... Blue eyes, and a turned-up nose, and there were two men standing beside... Sam! Next week... After you've had a tough day at the office or leaning over a hot stove, when your four walls seem to be closing in on you, next week at the same time when you want to get away from it all, we again offer you escape.
This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. That one starred Elliot Lewis. He was an actor, writer, producer, and director who worked in radio and television. He was known for his ability to work across all genres during the golden age of radio, which earned him the nickname Mr. Radio. Now, I didn't quite understand the title of this story. Enothera binus, the common evening primrose, is a species of flowering plant native to eastern and central North America. Evening primrose oil is produced from the plant and is used as a tea and skin topical. Maybe you can tell me why this was the title. I really don't know. Our story came from the series Escape. During the golden age of radio, most popular radio series had a set time each week. Occasionally there might be a change in the schedule, but on the whole a consistent time slot was something that helped build a large audience, and so it was something the big networks aimed to achieve. One exception to this rule was Escape whose time slot shifted an incredible 18 times in its seven-year run from 1947 through 1954. To make matters worse, it had the habit of coming and going, and sometimes disappearing off the schedules altogether, only to resurface weeks later in a completely different time slot. The flagrant disregard CBS paid to escape could make you think that it was just a run-of-the-mill series. This couldn't be further from the truth. Escape was, and is, one of the best adventure anthologies ever broadcast. It's true. It's Halloween time. The time for leprechauns, banshees, pixies, and hobgoblins to hold their annual powwow. Yes, and the old witch rides through the skies on her broom. Ah, uh -uh, not this year, Lena. But this year she streaks across the Milky Way with her knobby knees buckled in a Bob Hope's toothbrush. <laughs> there she goes. But how would the witch get to know Bob Hope? She accepted a blind date with him, the poor soul. <laughs> Sounds very romantic. Bing, I'll bet your kids have great plans for Halloween. Yes, but I nipped them in the blueprint stage. <laughs> oh, why don't you let them go out and have a little fun? Fun? <laughs> On Halloween, that demolition gang of mine makes a flock of termites look like a busy little builders. This year, they're going to settle for a jack-o'-lantern, and that's all. Have you got a pumpkin yet? No, we're just going to stick a candle in Brother Everett's mouth. He lights up very easily. <laughs> but I must say that Halloween has done much to advance the American way of life. A joyous season. And a welcome date on our calendar. That was episode number 561. Our listener stories today came from Elsa Kilmora and Cindy Ward. Two great ones, and my thanks to both of you for sharing them. If you want to follow the podcast or the blog, head to ronsamazingstories.com. There you will find any of the links I mentioned and how to contact us. Do you want to help the show? The best thing you can do is to tell your friends all about it and please leave reviews or feedback wherever you listen. Clicking that follow or like button makes us grow. Thank you for listening and I hope you come again to find out what are Ron's Amazing Stories. All of the vintage audio used in the podcast is believed to be in the public domain. Ron's Amazing Stories does not own the rights to any of the old-time radio used here. If you hold the rights to any of the shows played, please contact us immediately at ronsamazingstories.com.